Hello, I'm Dr. Christian Coachman from Sao Paulo, Brazil, developer of the DSD concept, Digital Smile Design, and I'm here to continue with the series of webinars. If you stay with me all the way to the end of this webinar, we will provide you with the link to download a compilation, a, co a combination of 60 articles that I've been putting together during the last few years, uh, beautiful articles that will talk about these parameters articles that will talk about smile design, facial analysis, and how to make the decision of transforming smiles for better. Today we're going to talk about the smile design parameters, the information that we need to know and understand to make the decision of how to change people's smile. These parameters that have a, as a goal integrate teeth, gingiva, lips, and face following basic rules, but also following subjective uh, parameters and the aesthetic experience of the professional that is designing their, the patient's smile. There's several uh, subtopics here that we need to control and understand. Lip dynamics, relation with the lips at rest and smiling, lip support, the smile curve, the dental facial midline integration, the dental midline and the facial midline. Buckle corridor aspect, the 12 o'clock buckle volume integration and lip support. Dental gingival parameters, morphopsychology and the optic effects of the teeth and gum. Most of these parameters are not new, they are basically coming from dentures. We actually believe that dental technicians and dentists that are good with dentures are usually the best smile designers because they naturally understand and they work every day with the concept of finding out the position of teeth and gum according to lips and face. So the wax rim becomes for me one of the major tools to improve and to practice the smile design process. Shaping a wax rim on the upper arch of the patient is something extremely difficult, I believe. So we started to analyze better our wax rims to understand how to become a better smile designer. So let me go over the major uh, articles that talk about the process of smile designing and the protocol, the workflow of the step-by-step -step that we go through. One very well-known article from Lombardi, very old. Actually, many of the articles talking about smile design are old, as I mentioned, coming from experts on dentures. The principles of visual perception and their clinical application to denture aesthetics. This is an amazing article from Lombardi that I totally recommend. When we work with the patient with the wax rim, for example, and we're going to use as an example of a dental patient, but this is exactly the same process that we go through when we design smiles for people that have teeth. The first thing that we want to do is what we call the digital face fold and determine over the picture where we want the midline to be and the horizontal reference to be. What kind of guidelines can we follow? Of course, the interpupillar line and the commissural line are two very strong visual reference that we want to integrate our smile to these two lines. So the bipupillar line represents a precise and reliable point of reference, but is not the only reference. Two-thirds of the patients, they have a very good relationship between a nice smile and the interpupillar line. One third of the patients they don't. That means that if we design their smile parallel to the interpupillar line, it's not going to look good with their faces. Then we need to find the average position between the interpupillar line and the commissural line to design a nice, pleasing smile. The facial midline is often the starting point of a dental aesthetic visualization on a well known article from Miller. The facial midline not always matches the dental midline and that's important and it, this is important to understand that it's not an aesthetic issue. We know that the issue comes when the dental midline is scanted 
not when the dental midline is shift. So the important thing is to have a parallel dental midline related to the facial midline. Usually to determine the facial midline we have three references, the glabella, the philtrum and the mentum if the patient will not go through orthognathic surgery. The philtrum is usually the strongest visual reference for us to determine our smile design. So we have to move this picture until this line is blending in with the philtrum. That's usually the best reference. As I mentioned, shift is not the problem. Can't is what we want definitely to avoid on the smile design process. There's a well-known article from Vince Kokic showing that the shift when inside a certain parameter is not aesthetically re relevant. And this is what we want to explain to the patient. That if the midline shift is inside this window, we don't have to complicate the treatment to fix this shift. So some patients, they have no shift, no can't. Some patients that have can't, but little shift, and so on, all kinds of combinations. So drawing the lines over the pictures will help us to identify these distortions and to present these, this information to the patient. So this is exactly what the article from Vince Kokic is uh, showing. The midline of the face and the dental midline do not coincide in 30% of the cases and that is not a problem according to this article. This is the well-known article from Kokic. If the difference between the facial midline and inter-incisal line is inside this, it's, the shift is smaller than 4 millimeters, then we don't have something relevant. So inside that yellow, those two yellow lines, we are safe. Next step, determine your smile curve. This smile curve will depend on a multifactorial decision. We have to understand the lip dynamics and the whole face to make the decision if we want to make teeth longer, shorter, if we want the buccal corridor wider or narrower. We have to analyze the patient when resting and smiling we have to also combine this decision with the gender, age and character of the patient. So we can see here that my white line, my digital white line here is demonstrating that my wax room is not ideal, that I need to fix my wax room or fix the denture setup. When the patient says E, that's an important article, we know that usually the patient needs to show more upper teeth than lower teeth and actually what this article says is that when the patient says E, the ideally we should fill this distance between upper and lower lip 80% with the upper teeth. That's the ideal. We call this point, the intersection between the midline and the curve as the meeting point of facially guided smile design because if we can determine this point the whole design will follow. The smile line is an evaluation tool of dental facial aesthetics. So what are the factors that we need to consider to make this decision where we want this line to be? As I mentioned already, look at the patient at rest, look at the patient smiling, understand lip dynamics because that changes our decision. Gender, character, age, phonetics and function, all these factors will interfere with this decision. The display of the central incisor varies according to some clinical aspects such as age, gender and character. That's also again from Lombardi. So what we know, women show more teeth at rest, usually men show less. Important information to take in consideration. Younger people show more, older people show less. So of course when older people come to us they want to look younger we need to increase tooth exposure inside certain parameters of course. Next reference, the dental lip facial relationship. What is the width relationship between centrals, laterals and canines? What are the reference that we can use? Internal side of the eyes, outside of the nose, these are usually two reference that denture doctors they use 
to determine where the distal of the canine should be. Digitally, what we do is to use this ruler over the patient's facial photo and determine where we want the canines to be. And when we know where the distal of the canine should be, this ruler will automatically give us the width of centrals and laterals according to that canine. So this ruler is very simple to play with digitally over the picture. We can make it wider, we can make it narrower, and we can then understand where we want the width relationship to be. Now, this ruler can change the proportion rate. There's many different proportions that we can play with. Several years ago, people were using golden proportion. We know nowadays that golden proportion is not the ideal proportion for this specific matter. What we use is the red proportion is slightly different and creates a wider smile, a nicer smile. Smiles created using the principle of the recurring aesthetic dental proportion, the red, were preferred by majority of dentists and patients. So this is the one we usually do. All these lines don't mean that the smile to become beautiful needs to match these lines perfectly, never. These lines are just guidelines and inside the smile frame we can play with our artistry and creativity and make things slightly asymmetric and beautiful. Next parameter, the central width length proportion. As we know from articles that the central ideal proportion width length is in between 75 to 80 or 75 to 85 percent. That means that if the central is 10 millimeters long, it should be 7.5 to 8 or 8.5 millimeters wide. So we need to keep that proportion in mind. What do we know from this information? Ideal range is around 80 percent. But we can play with an ideal central. We can create a beautiful central from 75 to 85 percent. And as a technician, we know that even on, on extreme situations, we can make a beautiful central utilizing optical illusion, changing the line angles and so on, if we have a proportion in between 70 and 90. These are the limits that we like to keep in mind. So what is important here to know is that if our central proportion is below 70, that means this central will be too long or too narrow. If the proportion is above 90, that means this central will be too wide or too short. Another information, as we know, several articles talking about the measurements of the teeth, Usually the central range is in between 10.4 millimeters long to 11.2 millimeters to create a nice central according to this article from Nelson from 2009. Next parameter, the gingival curve. The gingival curve, when the patient smiles, how much gingiva we see on the anterior area and how much gingiva we see on the posterior area very important analysis to be made. We know that we have different types of flip dynamics. We have people with low or restricted dynamics. That means that from small smile to a big smile, the upper lip moves a little bit. And we have people with extreme wide big lip dynamics, usually the cases that are more complicated to treat where the patient will move a lot the lower lip from rest to full smile position. We know from the literature that there are certain percentages in each one of these groups that is important for us to understand what the literature says. Different articles showing different things. Initially, from an article from 84, from Tian and his group, 20% of the people had low lip lines, 69% medium, the average, and 10% the high lip line. Interesting on the other article, numbers changed a little bit, 10% low, 52 medium, and 38% high. Now, we started a new research on that in partnership with Dr. Eduardo Mann from Santiago, Chile, 
and we started to doubt a little bit about these numbers. These are all articles made on top of pictures and usually pictures made several, several years ago with old techniques. What we realize is that from another article saying that usually when patients smile for pictures, they show 30% less in average than they can show. So analyzing and making this analysis through picture analysis is not the most precise way. So we started to research this through videos, creating natural moments with the patient where the patient is really laughing with freedom. And what we realize is that actually high lip line patients is above 60%. So this is the final conclusion for us here. Most of the people have high lip lines, show a lot of gum when smiling. The problem is that usually we don't capture the moment where they're actually showing the maximum soft tissue display. Another interesting thing that is important to highlight is that many patients when they come saying that they don't like their gummy smile, they, they actually don't know exactly what they don't like. And it sometimes is not the gummy smile if it's not a skeletal problem. Usually when pa patients say, I don't like my gummy smile, what they actually don't like is the gum line that is not symmetric and is not nice and the tooth proportion. So we, we can fix tooth proportion by creating crown lengthening or gingivoplasty or creating restorations to restore ideal tooth proportion and design the gum line in a nice way, usually people will have beautiful gummy smiles. So this is the article that I was mentioned, the work that we are doing, supervised and, and run by Dr. Mann in Chile. As we can see, we can have different smiles, different moments, different displays. So if we ask the patient to smile and we try to capture with the photo, it's very difficult to capture that moment where the patient is really stretching and showing everything they can. So if we film the patients instead and afterwards we can capture the right moments and analyze and do the research based on these images, we will realize that the information is different and the numbers will change and that's why we are getting this number of above 60% of high lip line. Continue with our edentulous patient. Papilla curve is the next parameter over here. What we have of information here? A very interesting research article from Stephen Chu saying that this curve or saying that the papilla height is usually 40% of the height of the centrals. Very interesting information. Showing that beautiful papillas are usually almost half of the length of the teeth. Very important information when we do implants to realize that usually when we do adjacent implants or patients with multiple adjacent missing teeth, we usually cannot restore that beautiful natural papilla because of this concept here of, that shows us that beautiful natural papillas have much more volume and length than we could imagine. So usually in between 30% and 50% of the length of the teeth, average, 40%. Another article from Stephen Chu, maxillary anterior papilla display during smiling. Interdental papilla display, 91% of the patients, they show papilla when smiling. So this article is more towards our study in Chile, showing that most of the people show a lot of gum when smiling. Another important information here, so when we do make a denture for a patient or a wax ring, what we try to do is to make those photos, the documentation with the wax ring, bring these photos to the computer and analyze these photos and draw our lines on top of these photos according to all these parameters that I just discussed. And we can see that many times we will find out that our wax ring was not, not ideal. And instead of setting up a denture that is not ideal and having to change it in the mouth, we can change things here on the computer in seconds and then build a denture that is already on the right position with the face. So we do that from the frontal, from the profile, from the 12 o'clock view where we will not only understand the volumes and the arch form and the arch shape according to the lip and the face, 
we will identify problems with arch symmetry to proportion, mainly to avoid common problems like this when you have the two centrals that are not even with the frontal plane of the patient's face. So these are all the parameters that we have to create what we call the smile frame on the computer and after that as I mentioned we can create the design that we want inside avoiding big mistakes. Utilizing our artistic skills we can create beautiful uh, asymmetries and natural design inside the frame. At that moment when the smile frame is already in harmony with the face we can then get into the details of dental gingival parameters. The parameters that we know very well that will guide us through the process of designing nice smiles and designing nice gum. We can even go further and bring the concept of morphopsychology and visages to customize this design according to the character of the patient. And at the end, the final touch, creating the restorations with all the optical effects that natural teeth have. So these are the parameters, these are the references, I hope you did enjoy. And to conclude here, what I want to say is that literature gives us parameters and guidelines, but smile design is mainly subjective. Customizing a beautiful smile depends on our, your artistic skills and you need to practice your eyes to see beauty and to create beauty. Details of color and texture are much less important than the smile frame, the 3D position of the teeth and gum according to the face. So specifically for technicians, instead of worrying too much with the details, is much better if we train ourselves to become better facial analyzers and create smiles that are in harmony with the face. Shape, texture and 3D position with the face are the key to create a beautiful smile design project. And to finalize it with this article here, from an orthodontist, the eight components of the smile should be considered not as a rigid boundary but as an artistic guideline to help dentists treat individual patients who are today more than ever highly aware of smile aesthetics. A very good article as well. I hope you enjoyed and please feel free to do comments and make questions here below the video. We will interact with you as soon as possible and answer them with pleasure. And also Please take advantage of the link that we are giving to you to download all the 60 articles that we will share with you uh, about smile design, facial analysis, and so on. Thank you very much and hope to see you on the next DSD webinar.